Our next speaker is Dylan Raphael presenting using tensor networks to study the 1D tricritical tri quantum Ising model. All right, so what we did was we studied the 1D tricritical quantum Ising model, and specifically what we were looking for is we wanted to find the critical exponents and critical points associated with its phase transitions. So those were a lot of terms that I'm going to unpack soon, but first I just want to go over a bit of background. So the first thing I want to discuss is quantum spin states. So spin states help us determine how a particle will interact with other particles and its environment. It's a component of the particle's angular momentum, and it's actually the quantity that we use to define the particle's state. So what a quantum system is, is it's a combination of spin states as well as a matrix called the Hamiltonian. So what the Hamiltonian does is it's a matrix that lets us quantify for any given state how much energy it has. One property of the Hamiltonian is that as we add more particles to our quantum system, its size increases, which has consequences that I'll get to later. So now I want to discuss the particular systems that we study, which is the 1D tricritical quantum Ising model. But first, I want to introduce just the 1D quantum Ising model. So both of these models are just a line of 500 particles, in particular spin 1 half particles. And the 1D quantum Ising model has a Hamiltonian that takes into account the interactions between adjacent spin states and particles with their environment, in particular a magnetic field. So what you'll notice is that for the 1D tricritical quantum Ising model, the first two terms of its Hamiltonian are the same thing as the 1D quantum Ising model, but there's also this additional three spin coupling term right here. And so this coefficient here for that term lambda is what's known as an irrelevant deformation, which means that if we were to vary lambda around zero, we wouldn't expect the fundamental properties of the system to change drastically. OK. So whenever we study a quantum system, one of the most important things to find is its ground state. And its ground state is just the state that is associated with the least energy. So in physics, the way we define it is that it's the eigenstate with the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian matrix. And what that means is that if we have a Hamiltonian, we can just perform linear algebra on it and eventually arrive at, and eventually arrive at a ground state and its associated energy, which is its eigenvalue. OK, so the reason why we want to study ground states in this case is to study their correlation functions. So what a correlation function is is that it tells us, for any particular pair of particles, how likely their spin states are to align on any given measurement. So a property of the correlation function is that it tends to depend only on the separation between the particles in question rather than on their specific location within the system. And the reason why we want to study it, particularly for ground states, is because it helps us classify systems into phases. So phases, um, two, two systems are said to be in the same phase when their ground states have similar properties. So for example, if their ground states have the same shape of the correlation function, then generally that means they're in the same phase. If we notice that the number of ground states changes or some property of a ground state, such as the shape of its correlation function, or you know, if your snowman stops looking like a snowman, then that's a pretty good indicator that a phase transition has occurred. And once again, that's what we're trying to look for in this quantum system. So what um, in particular, the way that we're actually going to be looking for these phase transitions is by looking for critical points. So for example, this snowman right here, it's just on the brink of, tr of changing from being a snowman to being a puddle. And so the point is that the critical point is exactly the point at which the phase transition occurs. So by searching for critical points, we can actually understand the phase transition a lot better. So, Whenever we have a critical system, which is just a system that's at a critical point, we notice that the correlation function of its ground state, when plotted against the separation between particles, shows a power law trend in its correlation function. So by searching for places that have power law trends, we would, know, we would be able to find a critical system. Also, um, the exponent of that power law relationship, which is called its critical exponent, holds significance in that it helps us characterize the phase transition as well as um, it's measurable experimentally. So it has applications beyond theory. So now let me discuss um, what criticality means in these systems that I introduced before. So the quantum Ising model, the 1D quantum Ising model, is very well studied. And we already know that when J and H these parameters that quantify the relative strength of these interactions in the Hamiltonian, when they're the same, we know that it's critical. 
And so what that means is that in the tricritical quantum Ising model, when those parameters j and h are both 1, and this lambda term is 0, well, then we're left with these two terms are the same as these two terms for j and h is 1. So for lambda is 0, this represents a critical system. So what our question is, is that how far can we push this lambda above 0 before the system stops being critical? OK, so what we have is that we can take so that we can def a, a certain lambda will define a tricritical quantum Ising model's Hamiltonian. Then we can calculate its ground state, find the correlation function of that ground state, use the shape of it to judge whether or not it's critical, and then ultimately find the phase transition. But the issue is in the process of finding the ground state. So remember how I mentioned that the size of the Hamiltonian increases with the number of particles involved? Well, as it turns out, um, the computational complexity of actually calculating that ground state scales as an exponential with respect to the number of particles involved because of the increase in size of the Hamiltonian. And so since it's exponential, this means that it's far too computationally complex in order to actually calculate this ground state completely. We must find some sort of workaround in order to approximate it. And for my, for my study, that, that workaround is tensor networks. So what tensor networks do is they let us take a large and complicated state and break it down into smaller and more manageable parts. We can also make approximations along the way, which reduces the dimensionality of the problem. So we use the DMRG algorithm to find ground states. And the way it does that is it can take each of these individual, smaller, more manageable parts, and it can minimize the energy with respect to them individually. And it's actually quite efficient in this case. So what we have is that for any given lambda, we can use DMRG on the tricritical quantum Ising model to find its ground state. We can check for criticality by seeing whether the correlation function is power law, which indicates critical, or exponential, which would indicate that it's not critical. And then we can just try out as many values of lambda as necessary to pinpoint the exact location at which the phase transition occurs. So now, with that said, let me get onto my results. So first, to get a general idea of where this lambda actually is, we checked between lambda 0 and 1. So we can see that for lambdas between 0 and 0.4, these correlation functions all show a pretty constant um, power law trend. And then as soon as you go from 0.4 to 0.5, it immediately just changes drastically to all zeros, which indicates that a phase transition has occurred. We know that lambda 0 to 0.4 is critical because um, the, that correlation function for those values of lambda display a power law trend. It's a very strong fit. So then to get it even more accurately, we checked between lambdas 0.4 and 0.5, the, the location that we determined where the phase transition occurs. So what we notice is that for lambda between 0.4 and 0.42, they all show a pretty similar shape of their correlation function. But then between 0.42 and 0.43, we notice a bit more of a drastic change. And this is once again supported by this bar graph, which shows that between point, lambdas 0.42 and lambdas 0.43, um, the system changes from being better modeled by a power law fit to being better modeled by an exponential fit, which once again indicates that the system has stopped being critical sometime between those points. So then finally, we looked to see between where lambda is exactly between 0.42 and 0.43. But the issue here is that we can no longer see that between any two consecutive values of lambda, we just we can't really see a very pronounced change in shape of the correlation function, which makes it far, far more difficult to discern exactly where the phase transition occurred. And so this is once again supported by this bar graph. And we can see that for lambda between 0.423 and 0.427, the quality of fit for the standard deviations of the residuals for power law fit and exponential fit, they're all within 10% of each other, making it unclear as to where exactly within that range the phase transition occurred. Also, this is supported by um, the critical exponents of, this, of this, um, this system for various lambda. Because we can see that for lambda is 0 to lambda is about 0.42, the critical exponents remain about the same, which shows that the correlation function shape isn't really changing. But then right around there, between 0.423 and 0.427, it's once again beginning to show a drastic change, indicating that that's where the phase transition occurs. So in conclusion, using DMRG and the statistical tools, we were able to pinpoint the value of lambda at which the tricritical quantum Ising model stops being critical to an accuracy of five parts in 1,000. And furthermore, we were able to find the behavior of the critical exponent as we increase lambda from 0. Further study should be done to find a, better, a, a more accurate value of lambda. And also, the DMRG algorithm works well in the 1D case of the system, but it fails in the 2D case. It just loses its accuracy. It doesn't work very well. And so, that 2D case is interesting because we can use a different algorithm called Mera, which happens to handle it very well. <laughs>
Finally, just some applications. As I mentioned earlier, um, this critical exponent is measurable experimentally, which means that if we were actually trying to conduct an experiment that involves uh, you know, a tricritical quantum Ising model, we could actually measure that critical exponent, compare it to this theoretical value that we found as a part of this study, and that would tell us that we've created the system correctly. Also, because of, um, also, our results can be applied to other systems in the same universality class as the tricritical quantum Ising model, which means that our calculations for the, um, the, fa the locations of the phase transitions as well as the critical exponent um, can be applied to other models, such as a superconductor undergoing a topological phase transition. There are many people I must thank and acknowledge who, without whom um, this project would have been impossible. We will now take questions from the judges. So I've got two. Um, one is you talked about ground states. So as you turn up this uh, three particle interaction parameter, what kind of regime do you move into? Like what directions are the spins pointed in the ground state? Ah, OK. So this three spin, OK, so the question was, um, what exactly is happening to the system? How does, it, how does its appearance change as we increase this lambda from 0? So the answer to that is that this three-spin coupling, as far as I know, it doesn't really have a defined physical significance. Um, so to be honest, I'm not really sure exactly how it would look in terms of how the spin states would change and how the, how the appearance of the ground state would change as we increase the lambda. It's just that this, what this term is actually doing it's just it's not very well defined in terms of what it means physically, so I couldn't really give you an accurate answer as to what it looks like. OK, sure. Uh, and then the, um, the other thing is, so um, in terms of order parameters for, for looking at like crossing this uh, phase transition, are there ones other than just correlation like that you examined, um, like I don't know, some sort of three-body um, correlation or anything? Sorry, could you repeat that? Like other things, so you're looking at crossing the phase transition by looking at the length on which these spins are correlated, right? But are there other um, observables of the system that you evaluated, um, like DMRG, or was it just this one? Ah, uh, yes, OK. So the question was, um, were there any other parameters that we took into consideration outside of the shape of this correlation function? Um, and just, and uh, yeah, besides the shape of this correlation function, um, what other parameters did we take into account in terms of trying to determine exactly where this phase transition occurred? Um, the answer is no, we only actually looked at the shape of this correlation function because as you could tell, it actually works pretty well in determining the location of lambda where this phase transition occurs up until three decimal points. And that's where it starts to fail. So we were able to get away with just using the shape of this correlation function. But if we were to actually try to get a more accurate value, we would probably have to use other, me other methods of deciding where the phase transition occurs. Um, so originally you talked about n equals 500 for your the size of your models. Yes. Um, did you have you what happens when you vary n? Okay. So um, the question was, I use n equals 500 for to study this tricritical quantum Ising model. But what happens when you vary n? So it doesn't really matter that n is 500. It just matters that it's large. So we studied the system with open boundary conditions, which means that. It's just a line of particles, which implies that the first particle does not interact with the last particle. And so if you remember, I mentioned that the correlation function tends to depend only on where, only on the distance between the two particles in question, rather than on where it is exactly within the state. But that's not entirely true for open boundary conditions. And that's because if you actually look at an edge, as opposed to looking at a place that's like close to the center of the system, it actually displays a slightly different behavior, just because there's not, many, there's not as many neighbors that are near. That, there are, not many there's, there are not as many particles near that specific particle that would, in, that would influence its state. So we just chose 500 so that we could just look at particles in the center of the state. Um, and so we can make the assumption that it, does, that it doesn't matter which particular particle we chose. But if you were to make it a lot smaller, we would perhaps notice some other, other effects that would actually make these correlation functions not look like these nice curves. It would actually look a little bit more choppy if you were to choose a smaller n. We will now also take questions from the audience. Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, I guess following his question about the term, I uh, see so you said it's hard to explain what it actually does, but is there a reason why people study that particular term? Uh, so the question was, why do we study this particular uh, three-spin coupling, which, as far as I know, doesn't really have much physical meaning? Um, and the answer to that is, I don't know. Yeah, following up on the uh, n equals 500 particles thing. So since this is a 1D uh, model, and uh, like the interaction between the uh, particles are like between the neighbors and the like the far neighbors and the other spin spin coupling correlations, right? So uh, what is like the is there like a uh, if you generalize this 500 particle term into like infinite particle term, how will your uh, model be affected? Okay, so the question was, if we were to, instead of using n as 500, use n as infinity, how would, this, how, would this, how would the behavior of this model change? And the answer to that is the only, th so as we get to just an incredibly large n, like 500, to the point where the exact value doesn't really matter, the only thing that adding more particles would do would be to change the actual energy associated with the ground state. But as it turns out, adding more particles wouldn't actually change where the phase transition occur, nor would it change the critical exponent associated with it. So the actual results that we would find using, my, using these methods actually would not change. All right, thank you, Dylan.